Let us read together Psalm 117. Together. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye. Carol, would you please come back to the instant? Please remain standing. We're going we're gonna to sing this this morning. David, join in. That's it. Oh, praise. As I'm kind of moving through the study and preparing my heart, I uh, find myself getting excited about the Bible all over again. And, um, and um, I um, remember reading one of the Old Testament um, scholars, if you will, uh, talks about how Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes kind of work together, and um, he calls Ecclesiastes the book of the head, and calls uh, Proverbs the book of the hands, and Psalms the book of the heart. And while I certainly don't want to argue with him about his position, um, the thing that I want to say is as, as I'm reading through and praying over the Psalms and preparing my heart for our time together, um, I'm finding that the Psalms are for the head too. Amen. Psalms for your intellectual capacity. You, when you read the Psalms, you ought not leave your brain on the table. You ought to bring it with you so you can think as you're reading. Psalms is for the heart because every heart issue is addressed in the Psalms without question. But the Psalms are also for the hand. And the hand would, would, would uh, suggest that the Psalms are good for application. In other words, they, they'll work for you. They'll, they'll work for you if you let them. They'll, they'll do some stuff for you if you let them. So I want to uh, encourage you again to continue to read with me as we're kind of moving through these, um, talking about these psalms, these, this book of, of worship. When we consider the psalms in light of the journey 
of God's Old Testament redeemed people. And we consider them as they are given to us and structured in our Bibles. What we believe as it relates to the historical dynamic associated with this particular order and arrangement is that somewhere near the end of Old Testament history, Ezra and a group of men of like mind got together and began to put the Psalms in a collected form. Now, don't misunderstand, Ezra's not the only one that collected Psalms. David collected some, Solomon collected some. We know that for certain history tells us that. But in his final form, the form that we have today, Ezra and his men got together and they organized it and arranged it this way because the ultimate goal is to teach the returned people, the people who have come out of Babylonian captivity and returned into the land. The goal is to teach them how to worship. Remember we said a few weeks back that they have a temple. The temple has been rebuilt. They have a temple, but they don't have worship. As their responsibility is to help them get to the place where they then, in, he reinstates the worship of God in the temple of God in the land. And so he organizes this, and what he does is he puts the books, the, the, the rather the Psalms, together, and he organizes them in light of Moses writing the books of the law. So there's a section in the Psalms that's Genesis. Then there's a section in the Psalms that's Exodus. There's a section in the Psalms that's Leviticus, a section for Numbers, and a section for Deuteronomy, and it runs the entire length of the 150 Psalms. There's a Genesis section and an Exodus section and a Leviticus section and a Numbers section and a Deuteronomy section. And the reason why Ezra does it this way is because he wants the people of God in that day to understand that all of their worship should be based on the word of God. Y'all ain't with me. So that true worship is rooted in the word. Yes, sir. Not what we've been taught, not our traditions, Amen. but true worship must be based on the word of God. What does God say he wants? Enough of us giving him what we want. What does God say that he wants? And if, in fact, we were to answer that question, what we would learn is that the God of the Scripture is calling us to lifestyle worship. Okay, I can't find. I missed y'all, too. Listen, he is literally calling us to worship as a lifestyle. And if that's true, then true worship cannot be this. It can't be that. It has to be something more. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see if we can work it out. Let's see if we can work it out. There, there are some, there are some, there are some issues that we need to kind of, kind of deal with. Keep in mind now what we said is that the, that the, 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 the books of, of, of the, of the law, um, the Psalms are actually um, organized and arranged around the books of the law. 
keep in mind that we also told you some weeks ago that the books of the law were written in the wilderness. They were written in, they were written in the world. They weren't written in Egypt. God was there and he was working, but Moses didn't write them in Egypt. They weren't written in Canaan when the people got, came into the land of promise. They weren't written there. They weren't written in the context of pain, Egypt, or in the context of promise, Canaan. There's an interim in between the two points. It was written, watch this, it was written in between where they were and where they were going. They weren't in the place where they were. They couldn't go back there. They've been delivered from that. And they had not yet gotten to the place of promise that God said was there. They're, they're, they're in between the two points. And that two points, those two points, that place in between is identified in Scripture as wilderness. That wilderness is not the place of original pain, uh -huh. and it certainly is not the place identified as promise. Oh, yeah. The wilderness is the place of preparation. Come on, help me now. They came out of pain. Come on now. But they're not really ready for promise. But they have to get, come on, but to get ready for promise, God puts them in this place called wilderness where he prepares them for what he promised. All right. Now, if we want to examine them in that light, and if we want to do something, and it's a stretch, I'll acknowledge to you it's a stretch, but you understand the point. If we want to look at it this way, They've been redeemed from their bondage, set free from their bondage, and they are going to a land that's better than where they were. You got it? All right. So if we look at, if we look at the land where they're going as heaven, and we look at Egypt as the world, then the wilderness becomes that transition place in between our old life, and the promise of a much better one. You got it? And the wilderness now becomes the pilgrimage, the place of pilgrimage, the place of sojourning from one point to the other. Watch this. And the other place, that, that promised place, is definite. It's for real. It's there. We're just not in it yet. And we're not in it because we haven't been, come on, we haven't been taken there. We, we haven't been moved there. So now we're in this in-between place. And it is in the context of the wilderness that Moses writes the books of the law. Because you won't understand the word if you're in pain. Can't grab it. As long as you're in the world, you don't get it. You don't need the word when you get to heaven. The place you need it is in between where you came from and where you're going. Do I have anybody here? Now, the reason why that's important, Shiloh, is because, stay with me. It is in the wilderness that God does something very specific to settle in the hearts and minds of his people where his heart is. What he does is this. He institutes 
worship while they're in the wilderness. He doesn't wait for them to get into Canaan, but he literally teaches them, no, he makes them worshipers while they're in the wilderness. Now get it. The way he does it is he has them build a sanctuary and then his presence comes off Mount Sinai and goes right into the most holy place in the sanctuary. You got it? And then what he does is he has the tribes of Israel literally and specifically line up around, set their tents and places right around the tabernacle so that the tabernacle becomes literally the center of the people's lives. So that, listen, when they woke up in the morning, first thing they saw was a pillar of a cloud. No matter where they were stationed around the tabernacle, first thing they saw when they got up in the morning was a pillar of the cloud. Last thing they saw going to bed at night was a pillar of fire. Are y'all with me? Listen, come on, the point is, is that God has himself in the center of them geographically as it, that way, but also he wants them to get it clear in their mind that I want to be the center of your lives forever. You got it? Watch now, stay with me. The way they become worshipers is by understanding that they don't wait to worship God on Saturday. Every day, they watch their priests doing something in the presence of God, and every day, somebody was bringing something to offer it to God as in the form of a sacrifice of whatever. The point is, is that they were called to worship God every single day. And the reason why he does it that way is because his message to them was the way you get through the wilderness is by worshiping. You worship your way through the wilderness. And if Egypt is a picture of the world, and if this morning... As a stretch, we say Canaan is a picture of heaven. Yeah. Then that interim in between the two points yeah. is where you and I are today, the wilderness. Yeah. And if you and I are going to make it through this wilderness, God's message to us is we got to do the exact same thing that okay. they did in their day. Yeah. You go through your wilderness by worshiping. You worship your way through the wilderness. Ain't nobody here. Come on, somebody. You literally got to know. You got to listen. You, and you got to become a worshiper. If you are going to survive in this wilderness, you can't make it any other way. You can gripe and complain. You can whine and all that, all that you want to. The bottom line is you're going to be in the same state you were before you even opened your mouth. The only way to survive I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. Y'all know me. Repeat that to me. It's a matter of survival. Yeah. It's, it's literally a matter of survival. If you are going to make it through this, I bet you this, Trump going to help y'all. It would be just like Jesus. It would be just like Jesus. To let him win the election. That's right. Come on. And then we sure enough have a Pharaoh in the White House, and then everybody in here talking about, oh yeah, now I understand what he was trying to say. Yeah. 
Yeah. Listen, you and I have got to learn this pivotal and important lesson, and that is if you are going to survive, if we are going to make it at all, we have got to learn to be worshipers yeah. now. Yeah. You, I'm, I, and I'm not talking about fronting on a Sunday morning. I'm not talking about acting like you on fire when you walk in the door on Sunday trying to keep up with or trying to impress somebody else. I'm saying you got to know this thing and get it down Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You got to act like this every single day of your life. And there's some reasons for it. First of all, the reason why you got to become a worshiper in your wilderness is because there are delays in the wilderness. Meaning, you have no idea how long you're going to be there. I need, I need you here. I need you with me. You got, you, you got delays. In, you don't know how long you have to be in this place called, you don't know how long you're going to be here. And wait a minute, and if that's the case, then I don't want to mess up some good days, come on, that I could be giving God glory in spite of what's happening in my life. Come on, why? Because I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but as long as I'm here, I'm going to make my mark. They're going to know I was here. Every time they turned around, he was talking about, thank you, Jesus. And bless your name. No, 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 no. I, I, I hear, you hear folks say crazy stuff. Like, no, no, no. I don't believe in that stuff, but he did. Yeah. Come on, y'all. Delays yeah. in the wilderness. But then there's something else. There's another reason. Not only should you worship in the wilderness because there are going to be delays, but you ought to worship in the wilderness because there are going to be disappointments in the wilderness. Right? Remember God, remember God brings them out and they get on the wilderness side of the experience. They kind of man and walking through. Remember the first thing that happened that caused problems in the land? No water. They couldn't find, and they in the wilderness. There were moments of disappointment that were found in the wilderness, and they were already set free. They were already delivered. Come on, but there were disappointments in the wilderness. So you got to learn how to worship because you don't want to be stuck in the context of disappointment your whole life since you don't know how long you're going to be here. Why in the world would you want to live your life in disappointment? There's something twisted about that. But hold, there's another reason. The reason why you ought to become a worshiper in the wilderness is because there are, there are dangers in the wilderness. They are moving through the wilderness, and every time they turn around, some ite is showing up. I ain't got nobody. A Malachite, Moabite, Ammonite, Amen. And if it weren't for the fact of, you know, where we are, I'd say Negro height. <laughs> some height is always showing up. Come on, there is some height. There's somebody that is always there to impede your progress. And the primary reason why they show up is because they have a fear of being displaced. I wish I had somebody in here. Listen, do you know, if you ever read the journey of Israel through the wilderness, here's what you find. Israel spent most of their time trying to get to the land. Their land of promise. You got that? And all the time they're making their way trying to get there, every time they turn around, somebody is rising up to attack them and go after them. 
Well, the reason why they're going after the people is because they have a greater fear of the people than the people understand. So that most folk who attack them are attacking them because they are literally afraid of them. And the reason they're afraid of them is because they believe that they've come along to take their place. Help me somebody. Wait a minute, hold it. And if that's the case, then what that means is it's not the redeemed person's problem. It's not their issue. They're just there because God put the only reason why they showed up in that spot is because God put them there. Help me in here this morning. And I promise you something, something special going to happen in your life. You better hear me today. They are rising up to go against them because they are afraid that somewhere along the line they're going to push them out the way, come on, and take over their spot. The reality is, come on, help me, is that if you got a spot, you got the spot the same way I got my spot. Come on, come on, come on. The reality is, is that the only reason why I got the position I have is because the Lord gave it to me. I got it because he gave it. And if you got one, you got one because God gave it to you. Help me somebody. What we both ought to do is we ought to rejoice about what, what we got. And stop worrying about somebody else trying to seize hold of what you got. Now, 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 come on, they're dangerous. I'm telling you, they're dangerous. The wilderness can be dangerous. I got some witnesses in here. The, 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 the wilderness can be dangerous because you got people who are always standing against you, trying to impede your progress. And they do it out of fear. They do it out of worry. They're concerned. Here you come along and you're doing all this stuff now. I've been around here for all this time. Ain't nothing happening. Well, maybe if you do what we did, you could get something like what we got. Ain't nobody here. Maybe, maybe if you stop griping and whining and complaining about your wilderness, come on, help me, and learn how to become a worshiper in your wilderness, you wouldn't be so busy seeing how I'm, how in the world can you be jealous of somebody if you are a worshiper? Worship, come on, come on, come on. Worshipers don't have time to look funny at other folk because their focus is on the one that they're worshiping. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. Do I have anybody? Now, but then on the other hand, there's, there are times when God himself will allow some folk to rise up in your life because he's literally doing some things in you that you can't see. Um, he's working out some stuff. And there's a specific kind of people that he brings along intentionally to rub you the wrong way on purpose. I said on purpose. Oh, no, it, this one ain't working. This one ain't working. So let me stick with this one. On purpose. I said say on purpose. On purpose. There's some folk that God allows to show up in your life. Because he's trying to work out something in you. Come on. And he put something in this person. Help me. That's going to help what's already in you. Are you hearing me? And he brings them along in your life on purpose for the express purpose of getting a hold of that thing that he put in your life. Now, when he does that, come on. When he does that, that's a benefit to you and I. When I said when he does it, he, it is a benefit to you and I. Are you there? No, no, no. I really need you to be with me here. All right? So now, when they come along and you're looking at them and you get there and you kind of deal with it and they, you know, they're irritating, they're rubbing you, they got you going, to, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you know what I mean? Come on, you know, you look, uh, 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 you know, I, uh, uh, no, 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 I'm not going to sit here, I'm going to go over here I'm, and you try to avoid them and get around and all that kind of stuff. You better, you better act like you got some sense. Worshippers don't have no time for any of that. You got to, if you are a worshiper, you don't pay attention to that foolish 
foolishness. Why? Because worshipers understand that God has a purpose for our enemies. Nobody. Ain't got nobody. I don't have, I don't have no help. Uh, God has a purpose, I said. You may not have a purpose for them, but God has a purpose for our enemies. And when you're worshiping, when you live, uh, when you live worship as a lifestyle, you kind of understand that God has a purpose even for your enemies. Let me see if I can help you out. Yea. I'm going to grab a couple of psalms if you don't mind. Though I walk. Through the valley. Uh, let me just say, let me just say this, and we're gonna move on. Somebody helped me with this a few months back. I think it was one of you helped me with this a few months back. Someone came to me and said, "You know, Pastor, if there's a valley, there's an indication that there's higher ground." You, I, it went right over. If, 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 come on, come on. The very fact that there is a valley suggests, in fact, you can't have a valley unless there's some higher ground. I, I, listen, you just got blessed and missed it. Come on, come on, come on. Why spend so much time worrying and complaining about the valley that you're in when you can see that there's an option? Come on, come on. Rather than whining about why am I in this valley, the real question is how do I get to the higher ground? Yes, Moving right along. Yes, Either I walk through the valley, shadow of death. Why? I will fear no, come on Bible readers, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Just knowing that you have them, Gives me comfort, yes, and I'm and, and come on and and, and I'm worshiping. Yes, I'm in my heart, I got my hands. I live in my heart. I live with my hands up. Yes, <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. So, yeah, yeah, I live with my hands up. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I live with my hands up. In my heart, I live with my hands up. Right? Uh, and then watch this. Thou preparest. A table before me in the presence. I ain't got nobody here. Isn't it interesting that he ain't trying to avoid the folk that don't like you? Instead, what he does is he blesses you and then invites them to come. And when they get there, he reminds them, see all the stuff you tried to do, everything you said about them, you see how you tried to treat them, you see how bad you treat them, you tried to cut them off and mess them up, look at them now. In spite of everything that you have tried to do, I have stood up with them and now I'm blessing them in your very presence. Turn to Psalm 27. Let me show you this. I'm talking about worship as a lifestyle. Watch this. Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Watch this. Psalm 27. Verse 1. Psalm 27. Come on, let's deal with the worship. I'm, make, I'm, talking about make, I'm talking about becoming a worshiper. You got it? Becoming a worshiper. Here it is. Verse 1. Psalm 27, verse 1. Everybody there? All right, watch this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Here it is. Watch it. When the wicked... See, I ain't got nobody. 
Every day, every day, every day of my life, in my heart, I got my hands up. Blessing his name. The Lord is my light and my salvation. That's why I praise him. The Lord is the strength of my life. That's why I worship him. And while I'm worshiping, my enemies are coming after me to do me harm. Come on. Watch this. My concentration is on him. But his concentration is on them. So that while I'm thinking about him, he's got his eyes. Oh, y'all ain't here. You never have to go after anybody because when you worship him, your mind is on him and his mind is on them. How do I know it? Glad you asked. Verse 2. When the wicked. Now see, come on, wicked people. They so stupid. They so crazy. They so they so dumb. They don't have no sense whatsoever. Here you are, heart and mind, worshiping God. And they are dumb enough to think that they can organize a plot. Put together a plan to get to you while you worshiping God. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, first of all, David says, I acknowledge the fact that I got some. Holy. And they are in my life with intent. They got a purpose behind it. Here it is. They came upon me to eat up my flesh. Stay with me. Now, I don't have no defense for all of my enemies because some of them don't show themselves. What they do is manip manipulate weak people to take action on me on their behalf and half the time they don't even realize it. So I don't have a defense mechanism to fight against all of my enemies because I don't know who they all are. But whenever they get together and they come after me to eat up my flesh, stay with me, they And the reason they stumble is because God trips them up. Come on, come on. I didn't do it because I don't know all of them. I don't know who they all are. But the Lord knows who they are. And what he does is this. No, 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 no. You ain't here yet. Come on, God. They say, uh, you can't bother them. They're worshiping. No, 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 you can't mess with them. They're giving me glory. No, 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 no. You're not going to shut their mouths. They're praising my name. And if they pray, if they're going to praise me, I'm going to protect them. If we praise him, he'll protect us. If we praise him, he will protect us. If we praise him, he will protect us. So, so, I got some other stuff to say, but I'm going to quit. Ain't no sense in messing up now. Yeah, yeah, I said if we praise him, he will protect us. If, if we praise him, he will protect us. If we praise him, he will protect us. So, excuse me. I, I, I feel like some enemies are about to rise up and try and get a hold of me. 
pardon me while I work out my defense strategy. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. And all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. And forget not all of his benefits. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. For his mercy endures forever. That's why we worship. We use worship, worship, worship literally as a lifestyle. We worship, we give him praise. Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know there's going to be delays and I know there's going to be disappointment. I know there's going to be danger. Come on now. But in spite of all of that, I got another D. I'm going to be deliberate. Yeah. 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 And I'm not going to let nothing take away my praise. I'm going to give him glory every chance I get. When I think about his goodness, I'm going to bless his name. Knowing that he's working. He's working on our behalf. Come on, why don't you go and give him something right now. Give him, do something. Do something right now. Don't let anything or anyone shut your mouth. You keep your mouth open and you fill your mouth with the goodness of the Lord. And bless his name. 